Well, now, um, thank you, Adam. Uh, so, Terry, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming. This lecture about postmodernism is going to be something of the joker in the pack of the set of lectures that you've been attending, partly because whether or not something is postmodern uh, is up to you. It could be a matter of your opinion. And partly because there is a view, it's uh, increasingly widespread, that all buildings are postmodern nowadays anyway. In fact... In my talk this evening, there's only going to be one architect who explicitly describes himself as a postmodernist. But what we're going to do is we're going to look at a series of buildings that emerged mostly in the early to mid-1980s, because these are the ones that are usually described as postmodernism, and see what it is that they have in common. And what I've discovered in doing the research for this talk, because it's not an area, although I was a student at the time it was going on, it's not an area in which I'd looked that much into before, what I've discovered is that British postmodernism turns out to be something quite different from what it was that I thought it was. Now, the building that you can see here, Clifton Nurseries, in the Covent Garden Piazza, was designed towards the end of 1980 by Sir Terry Farrell, and it is probably the most significant piece of postmodern architecture in Britain. Possibly even the fact that it doesn't exist anymore is part of its significance. It was built for Lord Rothschild, whom Sir Terry had met through Charles and Maggie Jenks. The critic, Martin Pauly, described it when it was built as the Barcelona Pavilion of postmodernism, and ten years later, when he reasserted that uh, opinion for one of Sir Terry's books, he added that, like the Barcelona Pavilion, it will very probably be rebuilt eventually. It certainly made a tremendous stir, because it didn't seem to play by the rules of architecture that were being taught at the time. It was brightly coloured, as you can see, uh, and it was covered in detailing that seemed to be playing around with the bits of classical architecture that people enjoy most. When uh, Sir Terry wrote to Lord Rothschild with his idea, he told his client that, and this is uh, a quotation from his letter, a classical revivalism called postmodernism is all the rage with students now. And to prove this, he sent him this, uh, a copy of the now uh, famous uh, postmodern classicism edition of the British magazine, I hasten to point out, Architectural Design. Now, what you can see from the building on the front and from the names on the back is that this postmodern classicism was predominantly an American idea. The only British architects uh, who appear on the list are Jeremy Dixon, who had built some red brick houses with gables and bay windows in West London, and James Sterling, who at this point was designing large, idiosyncratic, unclassifiable institutional buildings in Germany. The striking image on the cover is that of Michael Graves' Portland building, uh, which is something that, as a second-year student, I was shown, I would say, probably every week, because my second-year tutor had worked on a house designed by a Graves' office called the Claghorn House, which is the one that is painted different colours to represent the elements and the history of the old house. Uh, and it was precisely the themes of this magazine that architectural design turned to time and time again, as you can see when you look at a selection of the covers from across the decade. Architectural design had been around since 1930, but it had been bought in 1975 by the Kensington-based publisher Andreas Papadakis, and he spearheaded the classical revival together with the critic Charles Jenks. The technical editor at the time was Ian Latham, who is now the publishing editor of Architecture Today. In time, Babadakis, who was described by at least two of the postmodern architects I spoke to as subversive in a positive sense, also published special editions on the work of John Soane and of Edwin Lutyens. But 1975 is a significant year for another reason in the history of postmodernism. In October that year, the Museum of Modern Art in New York opened an exhibition of drawings and models from the Parisian École de Beaux-Arts, which is something of a landmark as it reminded architects and designers of the attraction and also of the value of high-quality architectural drawing. Now, what followed was an episode which was crucial to the development of postmodernism, but it was also extremely American, and I think in the long term misleading as far as our own buildings are concerned. We are at least far enough away from it now to be able to look at this episode more objectively, and I'm 
indebted to a young German scholar called Martin Hartung, who is researching it and who took me through the principal aspects of it. Essentially what happened between 1975 and 1979 was that high art American architects in a period when not much building was going on looked for opportunities to raise the prestige of their work even if it wasn't being built. That meant, for example, exhibiting their drawings and even their sketches as if they were what Jonathan Meads might today call art objects, framed, priced, curated, uh, in order to inaugurate a discussion about the importance and prestige of these drawings and their meaning uh, to the practice of architecture, and also to inaugurate a cult around Robert Venturi's book Complexity and Contradiction. You can see from the title of the AD called The Postmodern Object, there at the bottom right, that there is an attempt, rather like that of the early Gothic revivalists, to draw back into my own uh, earlier interests, to extend architectural ownership, that's to say branding, onto high-prestige designed artefacts. In May 1979, memorable date for many, the month in which Mrs. Thatcher was elected over here, the Max Protect Gallery in New York held its first solo exhibition of architects' drawings with a display by Michael Graves, who was then followed that year by Richard Meyer uh, and by Aldo Rossi. And in 1982, Venturi and Scott Brown held an exhibition there that was meticulously planned, not only in terms of the display and the content and the text, but also in terms of the people who were invited to participate in it and the events around it. Now, the relevance of this to the British scene was further exaggerated when Venturi Scott Brown went to work on the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square in 1985 and received a lot of attention for it. There had been, as you won't need reminding, a failed competition in 1982 with a rancid aftermath. The Sainsbury brothers, so memorably described recently by Alan Powers as the three grocers of the apocalypse, <laughs> then supported a redesign and the appointment of an American firm. Uh, the rather crude and chunky-looking building, and this photograph was taken for me by Patrick O'Keefe, I think, to make precisely this point, was not particularly favourably reviewed by most critics. The circumstances of the appointment were endlessly rehashed. The winding up of opponents by interesting, interested parties was further aggravated. The whole debate became polarised, and it became very easy to caricature postmodernism everywhere as a trashy, overclever foreign invasion by a series of preachy and annoying people. That's the end of the history lesson. But it's very clear that the ideas of the early editions of architectural design are mostly nowhere to be seen in postmodernism, although there is one very significant exception. That, and the closest to it, is probably the large-scale work that Jeremy Dixon and Edward Jones did in the, 18, in the 1980s and 1990s, obviously true in the case of the Mississauga City Hall in Ontario of 1982 to 1987, which is the most American-looking of all the British-designed postmodernist buildings. On the site of Clifton Nurseries, Dixon Jones repaired the piazza and designed a block which contains a new entry to the Royal Opera House. Now, for many, these fine paintings by Carl Lobin, one of which appeared uh, on the cover of AD, and which the artist has very kindly let me show you now, are as much of the concept of the Dixon-Jones scheme as the eventual version that was built. Here is a second one. There's one of the two views uh, up, looking west uh, along the north side uh, of the piazza, uh, and there is a fantastic nighttime view from the southeastern corner of the piazza. So all of that L-shaped building in front of you is part of the Dixon, Dixon Jones scheme. These paintings elevate the architectural design into a prestigious art-based experience, and they're not easily forgotten. They may well last longer, the imagery from them, than the memories of the building, the final building itself. Lorbin also produced fabulous paintings with lovely wet pavements for Dixon Jones's compass point scheme on the Isle of Dogs. Now, uh, rather than show you that, uh, I'm going to show you this one. When, this, when I was a student, I was a 
fourth year student um, when I first came across this, uh, and I thought it was terrific at the time. And I'm showing you this photograph by uh, French and Thai, the photographer's French and Thai, partly because I suspect that the images from the Modern House Estate Agency website will eventually become the canonical uh, source of illustrations for this period, uh, and this is one of them. Uh, but the other reason is that this photograph emphasises the, stu- the stepped Dutch elevation, which reminded me strongly of the terrace I grew up in, in Brook Green in Hammersmith, about a bit more in a moment. It seemed to me to be, in 1985, astonishing and wonderful that this type of late Victorian artistic architecture, and I haven't yet discovered who the architect was, could reappear like this. Uh, And I don't think almost exactly 100 years later, by the way, this is about 1883, this terrace. And I don't think it is just me that sees reminiscences of old buildings in some postmodern architecture. I went to the Dixon Jones houses the other day in St. Mark's Road and W10. They're the ones that featured in that edition of architectural design. You can see them there on the left. And on the right is a terrace of houses from uh, around the corner. It's just at uh, at an angle from the the, the buildings you can see with the post box. And there, of course, you can see uh, their Edwardian houses. And you can see on them the gables, the pitched pitched porches, uh, half timbering in a different form from the Dixon Jones version. You can also see arched windows if you look above the porch of the right-hand window. It's hard to say. Uh, I, I didn't, couldn't get close enough quite to see whether they'd been built like that, but the other house in the same pair has them, uh, and here are all those elements reassembled in a different form, in a 1980s form, uh, by Dixon Jones around the side. There's a final point about Dixon Jones uh, that I happen to notice, which is that on their website, their staff pose with architectural models, with fine white cardboard models, which sound, looks to me a bit like an echo of the American art object thing uh, I mentioned earlier. But this type of collaboration with artists is very unusual in British postmodernism. One of the things that makes the Dixon Jones scheme for Covent Garden British rather than American, is that it is the remodelling and extension of an old building. And this turns out to be a recurring feature. Terry Farrell told me that he increasingly saw architecture as a means to rebuilding towns and cities. And for that reason, he sees styles as being transitional, as they were for Asplund, as they were for Charles Moore, the one American postmodernist who is nowadays consistently uh, underrated, possibly because he's not around to go on branding and pushing himself. Terry went through a Scandinavian phase and a Craig Elwood phase, and if you won't mind me saying it, a kind of David Hockney phase with the water treatment works at Reading. When he was a student, he drew very fine, detailed, measured drawings of 18th century furniture, and in his account of the years up to 1991, he draws attention to the three buildings that he saw and that influenced him at the time. Norman Shaw's Cragside, Vanbrugh's Seton Delaval, and the astonishing neo-Greek house called Belsay Hall, designed by Charles Monk, uh, at the, designed at the beginning of the 19th century. Farrell's office published these drawings of new Georgian-looking buildings for a site between Newgate Street and Paternoster Square as part of the 1989 to 1992 master plan initiated by John Simpson. In the case of Clifton Nurseries, Terry says that he was thinking about the other classical porticos and pediments in the area, the Royal Opera House itself, of course, the taboo-era Theatre Royal Drury Lane, just around the corner, and although he didn't mention it, perhaps the curiously severe and slightly surreal portico of the Church of Scotland affixed to the otherwise smooth surface of the Fortune Theatre nearby in Russell Street. And certainly, by and large, Terry's larger schemes often took elements he liked, not necessarily from the immediate area, and mixed them together to create a mini-city, both inside and out. TVAM was designed as Clifton Nurseries was going up, and it created a sensation when it was unveiled in 1982, not only because of its decorative detailing, but because the front was completely different from the back, which is perhaps more familiar to us now. And that, of course, would be normal in any city block. Some of the larger projects that followed had very complicated pieces of planning in them. That is true of... of, uh, Oh, there's an interior. That's a kind of David Hockney interior, I would say. Uh, That's true of um, Albert Gate... 
built across London Wall from 1986 to 1992, and the drawings on the right give some indication of the three-dimensional complexity of it. Uh, and, of course, it's true also of Embankment Place uh, above Charing Cross Station of 1985 to 1990. has a great curved roof, evidently drawn from that of those of the most memorable railway stations, but it doesn't try in a modernist way to pretend that its form is related to its function. And uh, Terry used it for the cover of his 2013 book precisely to make the point about its urban role. Furthermore, although the Vauxhall Cross building annoyed modernist critics because they thought it looked like the Graves one in Portland, that's the one on the front of AD that I showed you at the start, if you look at it carefully, you can see that it is actually quite a different type of building. It's composed of narrow plates of office space that create a varied city-type edge rather than being a fat, decorated box. Uh, I gather that Venturi told Terry that he, uh, Terry that is, wasn't a postmodernist but a hybrid, and I guess what we have there is a sign that the prestigious American brand was being protected at Comin Ching, there's a nice uh, nighttime view of Vauxhall Cross there. At Comin Ching, at the Comin Ching Triangle at Seven Dials in London, Terry was able to remodel and redetail an historic piece of London with a loyal client, and over a long period of time, from 1978 uh, onwards, and this project has now been listed after a corner of it was mutilated. What is very striking about this project is the fact that not only does the architectural control extend to all scales, uh, but also uh, most people can't work out easily, if I return to that one for a moment, can't work out easily where the new insertions come, as of course is the case with any average piece, or really regular piece of townscape. It's the opposite of the old spab dogma, that new work must, must, uh, in italics, be a contrast between the old and the new. And yet, funnily enough, the next theme I want to take up is quite how close British postmodernists come to arts and crafts designers in most other respects. The first piece of evidence uh, I want to show here is this remarkable building, the Catherine Stephen Library of Rare Books at Newnham College, uh, Cambridge, by Van Hainigan and Haywood. When this went up in 1981 to 1982, uh, I was already a student by then, it was clearly very remarkable, although it wasn't very obvious to us why. And I think it's only with the benefit of hindsight that I can begin to understand it. Uh, this photograph shows it alongside Birkin Hayward's sketches. And Josh McCosh, who is uh, a partner today at VHH, told me that what the architects had in mind was the barrel vault that Basil Champneys had used in the old college library of 1896 to 98, uh, and indeed earlier in the extremely pretty Clough Hall alongside it from 10 years beforehand. Champneys' relaxed, linked buildings provided a very strong visual identity for the college. They're also very pretty, and people like them. The Rare Books extension was intended to provide more of the same type of atmosphere. There were also other stripy buildings going up at this time and a little later. The architect Martin Richardson, for example, des designed stripy housing at Willem Park in Milton Keynes in the mid-1980s, and furthermore, he drew them in coloured crayon on American detail paper exactly in the way that Michael Graves did. More architects than you might think show, in a most interesting way, how the architecture of sweetness and light, that is, the Queen Anne revival style of the original buildings at Newnham, reappears in British postmodernism. I had a fascinating conversation with John Melvin, who in 1986 wrote in AD on meaning and metaphor in the modern house, uh, and is the architect of some wonderful buildings for the Mercer's Company, which, des which deserve further appreciation. He himself had moved into Islington in the early 1960s and saw Georgian terraces being pulled down for new developments, which didn't only not, they, not only did they fail to respect the street pattern of the time, but also, in his opinion, had no real recognisable features. Regret at what is happening to old cities in the 60s is a recurring theme, not only uh, in Britain, 
but also in the United States. And in fact, Martin Hartung told me that it was this that lay behind the rediscovery of old plan drawings even before the various architectural exhibitions of the 1970s. In 1973 to 1979, Melvin designed housing at Penton Street in Islington that had some recognisable historical precedent uh, with arched doorways and parapets, with pitched roofs behind them and with front walls that came down straight onto the pavement. For this, he won a civic trust accommodation in 1979. And then, after a member of the Mercer's company had been to see the Penton uh, Street houses, lived nearby, I think, and went to have a look, he designed this staff accommodation for uh, St Paul's Girls' School, which is a Mercer's company foundation, also in Brook Green. This is in 1985. Uh, And uh, what John told me was that what lay behind this design was the architecture of the original school buildings down the road, which were designed by Gerald Horsley, uh, excuse almost a nighttime view here, uh, by Gerald Horsley in 1904 to 1907. Uh, apart from the formal symmetrical form and the red brick, uh, the stone dressing replaced with white paint, of course, the barrel vault form of the school, here's an image of it here, that's the main room inside, it's very similar to the uh, Basil Champley's buildings for Newnham. Uh, is also reflected into the new building in the form of that dormer above the, uh, above the roof. Also in this immediate area, as uh, John Melvin was well aware, there is a library, a Carnegie Central Library, of exactly the same date as the school by Henry T. Hare in um, what is now called Shepherd's Bush Road. Uh, and a little further down towards the Broadway, there is a very fine LCC fire station of uh, 1913, 1938 police station by McMorrin Whitby, possibly added something to the mix. And I think also uh, this building probably did as well because uh, John will have known it. It's the uh, former police building in Blackstock Road in Islington, which was very close to where where he was living. Uh, And the Victorian Society at the moment is trying to save it. In 1992, John completed for the Mercer's Company this remarkable block of sheltered housing in Essex Road in Highbury. Uh, And you can see here not only the Edwardian influences from Brook Green and from Hammersmith, but also, so John says, from uh, earlier work, for example, by Norman Shaw at Albert Mansions and elsewhere. What he said he wanted to do was to emphasise everything that was missing in the modern block on the other side of the road by, I hasten to add, eminent modernist architects that the 20th Century Society uh, exists to support, Uh, That meant that his new building would have doors, chimneys, railings, skylights, stone dressings, and lots of red brick. These, he said, were the elements that spelt house, just as they had been for Dixon Jones at St Mark's Road. Here is the (coughs) Doctor's Surgery building round the corner, which seems to me to take fairly explicitly from the Gerald Horsley building uh, on Brook Green. And you'll notice also the interior of the building is also finished to a very high standard uh, and draws fairly clearly, I think, from Edwardian precedents. Uh, John Melvin won a series of prizes for this building, and it's interesting what kind of prizes he did win. Uh, He won the Royal Fine Art Commission Building of the Year, but he also won the Brickwork Award of the Worshipful Company of Tylers and Bricklayers. Now, he told me something that seemed at first surprising, but which, in retrospect, makes perfect sense. He said that his most influential teacher at the Architectural Association in the 1950s had been his second-year tutor, the architect planner Elizabeth Chesterton, who had made him aware of the value and the importance of the historic fabric of old towns and, indeed, the primacy of planning in getting the design of a new building right. A little later, not long after John had graduated, 1964, Chesterton published her proposals for the centre of King's Lynn, which now look like having been something of a watershed in post-war planning. She told the town, which was hoping to embark on modernising itself, in particular its roads, she told the town to respect its historic memories and to preserve the waterfront warehouses. She suggested infilling them with new buildings, and in fact, even where there were to be new, large-scale, prestigious civic buildings... Uh, The colours and the textures and the materials, the heights and the building lines and the quality of the workmanship should be respected. This photograph 
was taken by the much-missed Martin Charles, who incidentally took the photographs you've seen, not only the ones of the building by Van Hennigan and Hayward, but also of John Melvin's buildings. And I think this might not actually be a coincidence. Martin was exceptionally aware of the physical qualities of buildings, and his sharp, clear photographs emphasised them. He moved very happily to digital photography and, indeed, into Photoshop. He told me once that what he really wanted to do was to photograph Victorian warehouses. What he really liked about them was their grainy, rough feel. And his final projects included fabulous photography for the books over the last decade on Ernest George, uh, on Norman Shaw for the revised version of Andrew Saint's book, uh, and on Philip Webb, all richly textured buildings and ones which, in John Melvin's words, were wearing so well uh, I suspect that in time uh, we will see that he played as much a part in the imagery of British postmodernism as Andreas Papadakis did for the American and international versions. What you can see here is the result. Uh, this is the new law courts. It was, they were designed by Ian Baker of Leonard Manassi and Partners. Uh, that's Ian's drawing on the left, um, and that's a recent photograph uh, of the complex, and they were completed in 1981. Now, there is more of this going on uh, in this period and in the lead-up to it than you might actually have thought. Leonard Manassi spoke a lot about vernacular detailing and drew it a lot. Here, for example, is a block of his uh, master builder's hotel at Buckler's Hard, which was built as part of the overall National Motor Museum scheme for Lord Montague. Leonard told one journalist that there could be no higher praise, as far as he's concerned, when somebody who lived nearby told him that he thought this building had been there forever. Now, the reason why this is remarkable, because it may look to you like a brick shed, is that what you're looking at here is a building designed by a high-art modernist architect from the Architectural Association who is working in tandem with a state-of-the-art modernist planner. The detailing of the edges of the gables and the proportions of the windows are by no means accidental. I can move on very smoothly to Richard Reed's Epping Forest Civic Offices, which he won in competition with partners in 1984 and completed under his own name in 1990. Here, the idea behind this design was to respond to the two towers that were already symbols of the town. The magnificent church tower by Bodley of 1905 to 1907, slightly to the west, and the water tower of the 1870s, further down the western end of the high street. Indeed, when this winning scheme was unveiled in the AJ in December 1984, the article recorded that the whole ensemble is conceived as an extension and enrichment of the English vernacular tradition. And a later article after the building's completion by Trevor Garnham, who is a historian of Letherby, which I think is not insignificant, referred back to Reed's analytical drawings that demonstrated the structure of the village. He remembered also that in 1981, Reed had written an article called Architecture and the Vernacular, uh, and he stressed in particular the idea of Letherby's that traditions are a product of time and of repeated work. Reed drew this scheme also in the popular postmodern way, as a bird's eye axonometric, so the references to contemporary American postmodernism are fairly clear. But the emphasis on the late Victorian buildings in the area and the fact that the project incorporates other earlier buildings, which it didn't have to do, uh, it was uh, open to competitors whether they wanted to do it or not, uh, make this piece uh, a, a canonical building in British postmodernism. Incidentally, Richard Reed was, like John Melvin, a Rome scholar, and I was very struck when I spoke to him by his emphasis on Italy and the central importance of Ruskin, on savageness and changefulness, and of the importance of drawing and sketching from historical buildings in his work, and also the influence on him of the post-war Italian architecture that he had seen at the time and ever since. When I put it to Richard that he might be a postmodernist, he told me that he saw himself as restructuring the modern, which in one way or another is a recurring theme amongst many of the people that I spoke to. One of the assessors for this Epping Forest competition scheme was Piers Goff, which brings me to the only architect I spoke to who described himself as a postmodernist. In fact, he told me that when he first heard the word, he wanted to make it very clear that he was one of them and he was associated with it. 
Fezgoff started up in practice, in his own practice, that is, as a year out student in 1968. Uh, and in his final year, after returning to the AA, he was taught by Peter Cook. He said that the intention in his buildings was to draw pleasure from the world around him, uh, and he said more than once that he identified most strongly, specifically with the pop art movement, uh, not necessarily of, for example, Roy Lichtenstein, but perhaps more of Alan Jones. Ten years after John Utram and John Melvin had been students, uh, and before Alvin Boyarsky became head of the AA, it was still largely scientific and rationalising in its teaching. And Piers Goff says that this at least told him uh, that he or prepared him for uh, creating a rational argument for justifying his buildings, however much he wanted to, for example, provoke the staunchly modernist architectural review. Piers Goff made his name as the designer of the exhibition held from the end of 1981 to celebrate the Edwardian architect Edwin Lutyens, led by uh, an extraordinarily distinguished panel of critics and historians. And that event is often seen as the turning point in British postmodernism. What he wanted to do, perhaps especially within the brutalist walls of the Hayward Gallery, was not to provide the conventionally sterile gallery-type atmosphere in which to appreciate drawings as objects, which Lutyens himself, of course, had disapproved of, but instead to evoke for a new audience something of the atmosphere of Lutyens's buildings. You can see here, for example, in this photograph by Morley von Sternberg, the gloss black paint which Lutyens liked to use. Beersgoff told me that he thought that the Edwardian period was the high point of architectural ability in this country, and he pointed out the ways in which Edwardian architecture would do something, for example, different with the windows on every floor. During the course of the 1980s, Scoff's practice CZWG established itself as the best known of the explicit British postmodernists. Janet Street Porter's house around the corner here, photographed by Tim Street Porter, was completed in 1987. Uh, the client was reported in the AJ as saying, I don't want anyone to like this house, which uh, almost certainly guaranteed a queue of young architects to turn up and have a look at it. In um, 1988, Goff's partner Rex Wilkinson um, completed the Cascades on West Ferry Road in the Isle of Dogs, which, when it was built, uh, uh, stood alone in a uh, very low-level landscape, while Goff himself designed China Wharf, which was named after the cat called China, belonged to the client, uh, which you see here both in photographs by Joe Reed and John Peck. It's very hard to remember now, but these buildings were very different from every other building going up and did indeed evoke the fun and pleasure that, architect, that these architects had striven for as students, which of course is not the same as saying that there is anything unconsidered about them. In fact, Piers Goff told me that he was envious of Lutyens' extreme control of detailing. Where the idea of context comes into China Wharf is in Goff's idea that the colourful splashes across the front of it evoke the wharfside life uh, of the river's previous incarnation. Now, there is an obvious reason why these striking buildings remained in the public consciousness for a long time afterwards, because in 1990, they appeared on the front of the British, tele British Telecom telephone directory. For those of you who are under the age of what, 40, 35? A telephone directory was where, you found, was, was where you found where people had lived 20 years beforehand and hadn't updated it because they would have to wait six months to a year to get a new number. Uh, and uh, every house had them. So uh, that made these very familiar. The final building in this series uh, is the circle. It's the one I, I, that I like best with these deep blue um, glazed bricks. They are within, in fact, the London... Docklands uh, zone, which Cascades wasn't. Um, Piers Goff said at the time that he chose this blue because it was the nicest colour in the shores of Darwin catalogue, uh, but he said also to me that he thought of blue as being a kind of landscapey colour, the sea, the sky, and so on. It's important, too, to this story to remember that these projects were carried out for a commercial developer, the kind of person that critics in the decade before thought was beyond the pale, uh, and that, again testifies to the fact that there isn't anything irrational uh, about the design process of these buildings. In 1993, 
CZWG completed these public lavatories photographed here by Chris Gascoigne uh, on Westbourne Grove. The client who subsidised their construction was John Scott, a well-known Victorian collector who had been an early and significant client for Farrell and Grimshaw and who will, I think, turn out to have been a very significant figure in the long-term history of postmodernism. And that's where I'm going to introduce John Utram, whose work appears at first sight to be quite unlike uh, that of any of the other architects uh, I'm mentioning. <laughs> I think it takes a reasonable awareness of the importance of the history of ornament, which I fear I might not have, to be able to look properly at the work of John Utram. I mentioned the Lutyens exhibition a moment ago in relation to Piers Goff. Utram was the designer of... Paul Atterbury and Clive Wainwright's exhibition called Pugin, A Gothic Passion, uh, at the v &A in 1994, which uh, may well turn out to have left a longer trail, and with which the same John Scott, whom I mentioned a moment ago, was also much involved. As with Pugin's richest churches, um, and indeed the public areas of the Palace of Westminster, every inch of Outram's architecture can be decorated in forms that he devised on the basis of his research. When I was a student, Outram started using Blitzkrieg, Blitzkrieg, which was a form of decorative concrete that incorporated blocks of bright colours. Uh, it was named because something uh, similar had appeared after the Blitz, made up from random pieces of coloured rubble. Utram described his use of it as part of what he called the iconic engineering of the conceptual environment, uh, and said that it can be used to embody any number of different ideas that relate both to its materials, but also to its making up, wet, dry, fiery, broken, pulverised, and so on. Architecture, he said, was more than plumbing or anatomy. Its elements have meanings and uses which can form languages of their own. This, for him, is the purpose of building. That doesn't sound much like the sort of historical references I've mentioned so far, but, in fact, it is not quite as far off as you might at first think. Utram told me that the sort of books that interested him were ones about language and semiotics, that is, the study of the meaning of signs. He mentioned Saussure and Chomsky, but particularly uh, he enjoyed reading ethnography uh, and read a great deal, and read a great deal of it all his life. At the Central London Polytechnic, where he started in training 19, in 1955, he was greeted with the announcement that architecture is no longer a literary medium. And accordingly, there was to be no reading list. The AA later was hardly any better. He said, as did his contemporary there, John Melvin, that the idea that architecture was anything but a practical science was considered ridiculous. Uh, and he had a version uh, of uh, Alison Smithson's But Today We Collect Ads, which is Now We Collect Catalogues, which he thought summed up the situation he was facing. What he wanted to do instead was to invent a universal set of ground rules. Now, this is not unprecedented in British mainstream architecture, and you only have to go back again to the late 19th century to see it clearly and explicitly in the history writing of W.R. Letherby whose book Architecture, Mysticism and Myth of 1891 was very widely read by arts and crafts architects. This book explored the way in which the cosmos was symbolised through buildings and showed how ancient designers delved into cosmic symbols, stars, eggs, trees and so on to create comprehensible pictorial languages. And this is very close to where Utram stands. Unlike Graves' Claghorn House, the building by Graves that I mentioned earlier, where the colours represent the elements, Utram did this through detailing, uh, decorative detailing as well as through construction. And he maintains a series of very interesting and thoughtful websites which describe in detail how his ideas and his designs and his languages involve. This picture here, I'm sorry it's a little blurry, is of Duncan Hall at Rice University of 1993 to 97 in the United States. And Utram said of it that he had finally realised his impossible dream. Not many architects can say that. Uh, and had managed to achieve everything he'd striven for up to then. It was also very popular with the public, which rather proves a Letherby point, which is that people will like things if they understand them, however complicated they might be. 
Uh, and Outram pointed out that he thought that the only critic here who'd got it was Robert Maxwell, who understands the significance of what it's about. Outram was well known in Britain at this point, mainly for the design of a large house called Wadhurst Park in Sussex, where Blitz Creek was developed into new orders uh, and new forms. But some of the smaller projects are important too, and they all need protecting. This is, uh, for example, Harp Heating of 1985, which has gone very recently. John uh, Outram sent me these two interesting before and after pictures of it. So that's before and after. These are pictures that he took himself of how the building was before he clothed it. And there's a second one which shows it from the side and what he did with it and also uh, a very clear diagram. Uh, He told me that whilst this building was being designed, he had written a novel uh, about certain architectural features in tablatures, hyperstyles and so on through different landscapes. The Isle of Dogs stormwater pumping station of 1986 was commissioned alongside others by Rogers and by Grimshaw and it's probably safe for the time being. This is Sphinx Hill, uh, an Egyptian house in Oxfordshire which was completed in 1999. But of course the British project which which assures Outram's long-term reputation is the Judge Institute of Management Studies in Cambridge of 19. 19- 90 to 1996. I'm very grateful to Edward Powell for supplying me with three excellent pictures on it. In his long website commentary on it, Outram says that this building should be thought of, uh, there's an interior, this building should be thought of as a fragment of some giant metropolis, unaccountably marooned in a little English county town. And he suggests that you come across it by going past his AA contemporary Quinlan Terry's Downing College building. I had a sense from more than one architect that they saw Quinlan Terry not as in so much as a neoclassist, which he obviously is, but as a kind of postmodernist himself, first of all. The website then goes on to poke fun at Cambridge. Here's a nice picture of Ben North standing inside it. The, uh, and says that the town projects the myth of what he calls the number one slot in the Albion League of Academics, full of rustic mechanicals winning Nobel Prizes. He has a website called Brexit Architecture, which is very funny in a similar vein, and also comes up with an insult I wish I'd thought of when I had to describe those flats outside the Commonwealth Institute. The last major architect uh, of the 1980s that I want to present is in many ways the most difficult for this subject, and he is James Sterling. In the postmodernist Annus Mirabilis of 1980, architectural design produced a special number on him, there it is, to celebrate the award of the RIBA's gold medal. Apart from Mark Girouard's biography of Sterling, and I personally would read and enjoy a shopping list if Mark Girouard wrote it, this uh, edition is still, still the most useful source of information on Sterling in general, uh, and even on his yet uncompleted work. In 1980, the Claw Gallery extension to the Tate Gallery had just been given the go-ahead, and the State Gallery in Stuttgart Museum uh, in Stuttgart was still under construction. The Berlin Science Centre was fully illustrated in this edition in Sterling's Pink and Blue. The only other project that looks identifiably postmodern in this book is a set of houses in Manhattan by Sterling and by his partner Michael Wilford, which in fact weren't built. Now, the most striking point to arise from both Sterling's acceptance speech, which is published in this AD, and Mark Girouard's essay in it, is the emphasis on historical style. Sterling provided a long stream of historical buildings of different sorts that he liked, and mentioning, for example, that when he was a student, he liked what he called the stiff Art Nouveau of Charles Rennie Mackintosh and of Joseph Hoffman. Uh, He then became intrigued by the English Baroque of Archer, of Archer, Hawksmoor, uh, and Vanbrugh, uh, and he talks a bit about castles and country houses. Then he mentions stripy brick Victorian architects, including William Butterfield, uh, which, which was a theme that Mark Girouard took up. There was an idea around uh, in, 19, in the 1970s and 1980s, which comes from Kenneth Clark, uh, unhelpfully, in the 1920s, that Butterfield's buildings were deliberately, sadistically, ugly. Uh, And to this, Mark Girouard says that the more that you look at them, the more you realise that this wasn't at all the way in which Butterfield saw his buildings at all. 
He was, says Mark of Butterfield, a very creative architect who could use buildings that were very unlike anything that, could, got, that had gone before. In this light, Mark Girouard says of Sterling's architecture in 1980 that these buildings were exquisite, reticent, beautifully scaled, delicate, totally inoffensive in the nasty sense of the word. Buildings which really were a pleasure and a delight to look at. In 1980, Sterling said, when asked why his architecture had changed so much from the apparent brutalism of the Sterling and Gowan days, he said, I don't believe that our work has changed. This makes sense if you see architecture as being about continuously conjuring with styles, transitional, uh, in Terry Farrell's expression, which is not intended as a pejorative way of putting it. Which brings us to number one, poetry which the 20th Century Society has helped save from mutilation. This building was designed in 1985 to 1988, but it was only built by Michael Wilford and Partners from 1994. That is well after Sterling's death in 1992. One of the architects I've been speaking to said that, in his opinion, Sterling was a strong editor, and this building wasn't edited. It also carries with it the whole long and unfortunate saga of the mapping and website demolitions and a high degree of Sainsbury Wing-like acrimony, including the political aspects of it and the accusations that the building is a kind of three-dimensional Thatcherism, not least because the Conservative Secretary of State, Nicholas Ridley, was the person who gave it permission following the second public inquiry. What might perhaps be said, uh, what might be uh, said of it is that what you're looking at is a kind of advanced concept model rather than what might have been Sterling's final scheme. Some architects, and that certainly includes both Lutyens and Philip Webb, developed their ideas for buildings by lining up historical models in front of them, and maybe this is one of them. But it's clearly a very extraordinary affair, even if, like the Houses of Parliament, it's so different from everything else that it's very, very difficult to know what can be said about it stylistically, and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say at that at the end. This, um, the fact that this building has recently been listed uh, makes this a good place to draw the line under the 1980s postmodernists. The historic England list description calls it an unsurpassed example of commercial postmodernism on a monumental scale, intricate in its planning and rigorously scrutinised and executed. So you have there a formal endorsement uh, of postmodernism. I want to leave you, though, with four further images. The First of these is an example of how, in fact, AD's version of postmodernism and the new urbanism that soon followed it is more alive than one might think. This is the master plan and detailed scheme by Porphyrios Associates for the Bay Campus of the University of Swansea, uh, some of which has already been built. Now, to some extent, this could be part of your lecture on Neo-Georgian, because most of the fronts look like the fronts of Georgian terraces. But the grand scale of the plan, and I think also in particular the graphic, the graphics of the way in which the architects illustrate it, have illustrated it, put it clearly into the family of projects that starts in England, or Britain I should say in this case, with, Dix, with Dixon Jones. This two-page spread actually comes from the winter 2016-17 to 17 detail supplement published by Ibstock Bricks, uh, and the story is entitled Tradition and Technology. Now, there is some significance in this. The success of the Gothic Revival was due to the fact that it could face technical challenges from kitchens to railway stations head-on without evasion. And the rediscovery and the reinvention of materials that followed it fed into the design itself. That aspect is particularly clear in the work of Shorten Associates, which came to prominence with the design of this. This is the Queen's Building at De Montfort University in Leicester of 1991-93, to 93, photographed here by Peter Cook, and is still best known for emphasising the technological input of its buildings in the design of the roofs and the facades very much in the early Victorian realist manner. In 2008, the practice designed this gable at the rear of a building facing Pall Mall, uh, that was eventually executed by MJP architects and is photographed here by Peter Durant. The facade is what you can see from the courtyard from behind Berry Brothers, which is towards the corner, the bottom of 
uh, St. James's Street. It's been inserted into a project that's actually quite complicated. It retains an Edwardian elevation at 62, Pall Mall, but it remakes the 1949 elevation to number 63 by the Art Deco, or the modern, perhaps, architects, uh, Welsh and Lander, apparently on the basis of research uh, by Alan Short into those architects' original intentions. So, while on the one hand, this is a building that does pay tribute to the great, uh, to the, 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 the great era of the American postmodernists, I think the open screen thing, you see it a lot in Venturi uh, and in Charles Moore's work, uh, is essentially uh, an American device. Uh, it combines a number of essentially English postmodern elements too. It incorporates a transformative remodeling on a tight site, and it refers back in several different ways to the architecture of its immediate area, as Terry Farrell has been doing. The article about it in Architecture Today, by the way, was written by that same Ian Latham, uh, and I was interested to see that one of his few criticisms was that the new building did not relate further to the Norman Shaw building of the 1880s, which is stripy uh, and has a Dutch gable, which, of course, would have made it more typical of British postmodernism. Still, the final image here, and it completes the cycle, which started with Clifton Nurseries, uh, is a, uh, a lovely, very recent building by, uh, called the Teddington Folly by Timothy Smith and Jonathan Taylor, who are two young architects who teach a design studio at Kingston University. This is an extension to the rear of a listed Victorian cottage. And although the project is small in plan, it has a grand layout, layout on Fiard, which culminates in this garden pavilion-like elevation. It brought me back slightly to some of the discoveries I'd made when researching Victorian or pre-Victorian parsonages in the early 19th century. It was very clever use of plan on a tiny space to squeeze as many things as possible out of it. Uh, and I thought I'd leave this image up at the end, as it seems to me that it says quite a bit about the future directions that postmodernism, or whatever it is you decide to call it, will be travelling down in future, as well as some of the places it's already arrived at, and which we don't yet know enough about. Thank you.